I'm Michael Sinato with the Real News Network. Uh, we have with us uh, Illinois congressional candidate uh, Anthony Clark. Uh, Mr. Clark, uh, what do you think a progressive Trump resistance uh, should look like? Uh, yeah, I'm pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, humbling experience, and this is great. So first and foremost, for me, I think it's important to recognize that it needs to be the resistance. Uh, I believe that Trump and the current administration is a byproduct of systemic issues that we've been facing for decades and decades. There have been hundreds and thousands of people before us that have sacrificed their lives uh, to enact and impact change uh, on a systemic level. So for me, it's not a Trump resistance. While, while he's a byproduct, while he's the individual that's emboldening people, emboldening people and uh, creating from covert to overt, it's the overall resistance. And uh, that's why we're here today because, again, it's these systemic issues that we're facing, racism, sexism, homophobia, classism, ableism, you know, the oppressive isms that exist. In order for them to truly be eliminated and for us to truly impact change, we have to build diverse coalitions. We have to tap into empathy, tap into intersectionality, and understand that when we do that, you create, you go from a singular movement to a mass movement and you cannot be marginalized because too often I feel like movements are marginalized because the, the opposition looks at it and says, oh, that's just one group of individuals. But when each and every one of us, no matter our demographic or socioeconomic differences come together, you know, imagine how powerful that is. And I think that's what we're doing here. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to make change. We really are. And uh, what inspired you to run for Congress and what do you think it's going to take for progressives to, to uh, break through the corporate uh, oligarchy of the Democratic Party establishment? Definitely, definitely. So growing up, my grandfather, he was a huge Muhammad Ali fan. Uh, he always told me that service to others is the rent you pay for room here on this earth. So I've dedicated my life essentially to trying to give back. You know, I served my country, active duty military, trying to give back. I became a special education teacher, again, trying to give back. And just moving forward, I recognized that essentially, you know, using the analogy, paying rent wasn't enough, you know, because there's so many individuals in their communities and around this nation that lack ownership. So we have to move essentially from paying rent to rent to own. Like, how do we give back and create ownership for the individuals that we're trying to help and support? Uh, and Brand New Congress is an opportunity for me. Uh, from being a teacher and, you know, I run a nonprofit in, my, in the 7th District. Uh, when Brand New Congress reached out and I learned about their platform and they learned about me and we vetted each other, I identified that this is a calling. This is an opportunity to, again, create ownership. And I think that's how progressive candidates, new progressive candidates like myself, can truly impact change when you tap into the community. You know, when you're on the ground floor and you recognize, truly recognize the issues, because it should be people over politics. Not politics, not special interest groups, not self-interest over people. People over politics. And when you truly know what the people need and what they want and desire, I believe they buy into and believe in the movement. And then you tap into that and you utilize that together because I'm not running alone. This is gonna take you, it's gonna take you, it's gonna take everyone running with me in order for me to win, in order for all of us to win and create the systemic change that we need. So just believing in the movement, just truly believing, don't become jaded, don't just say, well, my life is good. Empathize and recognize what others are going through as well as human beings. Tap into that empathy, tap into that intersectionality and understand that by you making a difference, whether it's donating, whether it's time, whether it's posting something, whether it's going to a meeting and educating yourself, everything matters, you know? And uh, what do you make of uh, you know some of the the policies that Rahm Emanuel in Chicago has been uh, you know pushing? Mm -hmm. You know he's met with Betsy DeVos in April. Right. Uh, you know he uh, rescinded his decision to reform the police department uh, right. based on a uh, Trump administration rule. Right. Uh, so so what do you make of all that? And uh, how can progressives uh, you know get Democrats like that uh, out of office? Yeah, I mean first and foremost educate yourself because what you just told me I'm going to assume there's still individuals that care that may not necessarily know that information so first and foremost it's important to educate yourself secondly based upon you educating yourself take that knowledge and decide what you can do is it involve yourself in activism is it involve yourself in impacting policy is it attending marches is it putting out information to educate others uh, because what happens is again our leadership they're not transformative they're not leading to help us they're leading to help themselves you know what what is my next move what is my next agenda? What is my next mission uh, to empower myself, not empower the communities? So right now, I mean, perfect example, if you look at Chicago public school system, we almost ended three weeks early. Uh, that would have been tragic. I taught in CPS. Also, the privatization of our public school services, janitorial services are being privatized. I will task you again about educating. Look up CPS and Aramark. It's Aramark, A-R-A-M-A-R-K. 
how they're privatizing janitorial service, how they're privatizing the food services in our school systems, and they claim that it's cheaper. But in the long run, it's more expensive because, again, our children that oftentimes lack the ownership that are marginalized, they're being underserved. The food is moldy. Our classes and the classrooms are filthy. So we, are we truly valuing education? Are we truly valuing human beings? So again, I could ramble on this for days. I'm truly passionate about it. But educate yourself, and based upon that education, identify how you can act. Uh, because it's so important, because we need each and every one of you to make a difference. Chicago is very interesting when it comes to public education for a lot of reasons. It was the home of the first teachers union, um, home of um, local school councils, which was a crowning achievement of the, public, of the civil rights movement in Chicago and also the home of mayoral control of schools. Um, but now in, um, in the state capitol, there's a bill that would, that would break that mayoral control. There would be an elected school board in, in Chicago. Can you talk about um, where that stands right now and, and, and what impact that could have on local communities um, whose schools are being um, disinvested or being privatized? Uh, yes. Yeah, so. What we, what we just talked about is currently Chicago Public Schools, we do not have an elected school board. So essentially, that is not a representation of the community. When you have an elected school board, you're allowing the community to speak, to talk, to vote, to make their choice of who can best represent them uh, as stakeholders. We don't have that. They're placed because of the mayoral, mayoral control that exists. So this has been on the agenda for quite some time. We have been talking about this. The teachers union has been behind it. This is not the first year this has been on the table. And it was tabled. Uh, <laughs> but now we're revisiting it. Now we're coming back and it, it possibly can be pushed forward. But it's extremely important that we have an elected school board because, again, it should be people over politics. We need the people's representation. And without that, you're not getting that. You're getting the special interests, you're getting the self-serving individuals that feel beholden to a mayor, feel beholden to other established individuals that place them in certain positions to make decisions. That's not gonna make a difference. Right now, if you look at the lack of equity that exists within our public school systems, property tax funding. Our public schools being funded by property taxes. A, a, a zip code or area code should not determine if your child or children has an equal opportunity for education. That is not equitable. So we truly need to make a difference. We truly need to go to an elected school board. So if you don't know about that, educate yourself. Reach out to your aldermen. Reach out to anybody, your leaders in your community, to truly push for this. Get your voice heard, because without it, we're going to continue to suffer. My name is Samantha Nichols, and I'm a leader with the People's Lobby and Reclaim Chicago. And 10 months ago, I was raped. Ten months ago, my body was violated. Someone ignored my no. And these last ten months have been some of the most difficult in my entire life. It has been a struggle to get out of bed some mornings, and I have questioned on many occasions whether or not life is still worth it. And it took me a while to realize what had even happened, that I had actually been raped. And it took me even longer to realize that I needed help. And so after months of anger and fear and exhaustion and a wavering will to live, I finally asked for help. And so I sought out mental health care. I sought out mental health care, and this was a huge step for me because my family didn't talk about health care, mental health care, when I was growing up. And I found myself sitting in this therapist's office, and I was feeling a little awkward, a little nervous, but I also felt pretty good because I knew in that moment, in that office, that this was the right and necessary step for me to take. But then we had to talk about money, specifically how much money I would have to pay this therapist each week. And her sliding scale only slid as low as $50 per session. I can't afford that. I couldn't even afford to pay for that first session. The only reason I was able to hand her a $50 bill was because my dad had given me a $50 bill when he had visited a few days before, saying, spend it on something fun. And so I cried in this office, and I cried the entire way home because I had taken this huge step to seek help, to heal from this trauma, but I couldn't actually afford it. And so I felt desperate and I felt alone. And I still feel angry because it doesn't have to be this way. 
mental health care, like all health care, can be free. And it can be accessible for all people, so long as the rich pay their fair share. And this conviction is at the heart of my collective's work around the Illinois state budget crisis. For two years, we have gone without a budget. And that is on top of years and years of cutbacks. And so we created a budget. We created the People and Planet First budget, which generates $23.5 billion in revenue by closing corporate tax loopholes, enacting a progressive income tax, and passing a financial transactions tax. And that revenue would go towards fully funding health care, including mental health care, PK through 12 education, infrastructure development, green energy, free college, and more. And this budget would change my life. And so I marched for this budget. I marched 200 miles from Chicago to Springfield for this People and Planet First budget. And we stormed the Capitol, and we disrupted a House session, and we staged a sit-in outside the governor's office. I marched 200 miles sharing this progressive vision for our state's budget with people in communities that are urban, suburban, and rural all across the state. And I was met with excitement around this vision. I marched 200 miles and shared my story with people who I had never met, people who have also been sexually assaulted, people who have also been unable to afford mental health care. And that makes me angry. I am angry that we live in a world where our bodies are used and abused. I am angry that we live in a world where the life-saving support services that we need to heal from this trauma are so often too expensive. I am angry that so many people have a similar story to tell, but I find hope in the work of my collective. I found hope in every step on that march to Springfield. I find hope knowing that our People and Planet First budget reached millions of people, even eliciting comments from the offices of Governor Bruce Rauner, Speaker Mike Madigan, and Senate President John Cullerton. This People and Planet First budget is an aspirational vision for our state's budget, but it is grounded in real numbers, in real policies, and in the real experiences of people all across this state, including my own. Because 10 months ago, I was raped. My body was violated, it was taken advantage of, my no was ignored, and I was left feeling shame and guilt, even though I know I don't have to feel that way. But I choose to use my body to not only resist, but to fight for something better, to march 200 miles, to sit outside the governor's office, to be dragged away by police officers. Because I know that no one gets to tell me what I do with my body, so I choose to embody justice and fight for the world that we all need and deserve. Thank you. Mr. Betts, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to, to run uh, and a little bit about your campaign? Absolutely. So my name is Gino Betts. I grew up on the west side of Chicago, actually. Um, what inspired me to run for judge is looking at the demographic of folks locked up in the Cook County Jail. I mirror that same demographic. The highest demographic of folks in our jails are black men from the south side of Chicago, born into poverty, that are in their mid to early 30s. That's exactly my demographic. I feel like to reach the folks that will be coming into my courtroom, I should be cut from that same cloth. And uh, you know, what do you make of uh, establishment Democrats like Rahm um, Emanuel uh, in Chicago? What do you think it's going to take for progressives to defeat those kind of Democrats? So I don't think anyone is in the business of giving up power. So anytime you want to uh, make a change and, uh, you know, that we're in a climate right now where folks want change, we all got to come together and use our resources, pull them together. And that's how you effectuate change. And. Um I know Chicago has a long history of organizing and resistance that goes back generations, but some people were asking questions about why 
some of the black led organizing in Chicago isn't more represented in this conference right here. Do you have any insight or thoughts into that? There's there's the movement for reparations, there's the education movement, there's the police reform movement, which is in jeopardy right now because the Trump administration might nix the uh, consent decree. Um, can you, do you have any thoughts about that or, or or what people here should know about what's going on in Chicago right now? You know, I think there's a lot going on in Chicago right now. We're moving towards uh, criminal justice reform. And, you know, my own personal interest in, in my campaign for judges, folks don't really talk about how judges are the gatekeepers to the criminal justice system, that folks don't stay in jail unless a judge makes that decision, right? And I think in terms of getting folks to come out and to uh, embrace conventions like this, they just have to know about it. We have to meet people where they are, go talk to them, uh, have them understand why their their voice it matters and why they need to be heard and extend that that olive branch and they will come out, they will show up. I know Chuy Garcia ran, um, you know, primaried Rahm Emanuel last year. He did better, he beat all expectations, forced him to a runoff. Um, what what lesson does that, uh, it, is, was there a lesson there in running establishment politicians like Rahm Emanuel that can call in a President Obama that have tremendous national support. They're bankrolled by, bankrolled by some of the wealthiest people in this country. Are there lessons for, for grassroots insurgencies taking on the most powerful interests in the, in the country? I think for me, the lesson to be learned was that we are the change that we've been waiting on. You know what I'm saying? So on the, on the south side of Chicago, we want to see change. We're going to have to come together to effectuate that change. Again, no one is giving up power, so we got to come together and take that power.